Part One of The Cave on Thundercloud by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrari. The Cave on Thundercloud by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Part One. It is doubtful if Aggie and I would have known anything about Tish's plan had Aggie not seen the advertisement in the newspaper. She came to my house at once in violent excitement and with her bonnet over her ear and gave me the newspaper clipping to read. It said, Wanted, a small donkey, must be gentle, female, and if possible, answer to the name of Modestine. Address X-27, Morning News. Well, I said when I had read it, did you insert the advertisement, or did you propose to answer it? Aggie was preparing to take a drink of water, but the water being cold and the weather warm, she was dabbing a little on her wrist first to avoid calling. She looked up at me in surprise. Do you mean to say, Lizzie, she demanded, that you don't recognize that advertisement? Modestine, I reflected. I've heard the name before somewhere. Didn't Tish have a cook once named Modestine? But it seemed that that was not it. Aggie sat down opposite me and took off her bonnet. Although it was only the first of May, the weather, as I have said, was very warm. To think, she said heavily, that all the time while I was reading it aloud to her, when she was laid up with neuralgia, she was scheming and planning and never saying a word to me. Not that I would have gone, but I could have sent her mail to her, and at least have notified the authorities if she disappeared. Reading what aloud to her? Her mail? I asked sharply. Travels with a donkey, Aggie replied. Stevenson's Travels with a Donkey. It isn't safe to read anything aloud to Tish any more. The older she gets, the worse she is. She thinks that what any one else has done she can go and do if she should read a book on poultry farming she would think she could teach a young hen to lay an egg as aggie spoke a number of things came back to me i recalled that the sunday before in church tish had appeared absorbed and even more devout than usual and had taken down the headings of the sermon on her missionary envelope but that, on my leaning over to see if she had them correctly, she had whisked the paper away before I had had more than time to see the first setting. It had said, Rubber Heels. Aggie was pacing the floor nervously, holding the empty glass. She's going on a walking tour with a donkey, that's what, Lizzie, she said, pausing before me. I could see it sticking out all over her while I read that book. And if we go to her now and tax her with it, she'll admit it. But if she says she is doing it to get thin, don't you believe it? That was all Aggie would say. She shut her lips and said she had come for my recipe for caramel custard. But when I put on my wraps and said I was going to Tish's, she said she would come along. Tish lives in an apartment, and she was not at home. Miss Swift, the seamstress, opened the door and stood in the doorway so we could not enter. I'm sorry, Miss Aggie and Miss Lizzie, she said, putting out her left elbow as Aggie tried to duck by her, but she left positive orders to admit nobody. Of course, if she had known you were coming, but she didn't. What are you making, Miss Letitia? Aggie asked sweetly. Summer clothes? Yes, some little thin things. It's getting so hot. Hmm. I see you are making them with an upholsterer's needle, said Aggie, and marched down the hall with her head up. I was quite bewildered, for even if Tish had decided on a walking tour, I couldn't imagine what an upholsterer's needle had to do with it, unless she meant to upholster the donkey. We got down to the entrance before Aggie spoke again. Then, what did I tell you, she demanded. That woman's making her a... But at that very instant there was a thud under our feet, and something came ping through the floor, not six inches from my toe, and lodged in the ceiling. Aggie and I stood looking up. It had made a small round hole over our heads, 
and a little cloud of plaster dust hung round it somebody shot at us declared aggie clutching my arm that was a bullet i stooped down and felt the floor there was a hole in it and from somewhere below i thought i heard voices it was not very comfortable standing there on top of heaven knows what but we were divided between fear and outrage and our indignation won with hardly a word we went back to the rear staircase and so to the cellar halfway down the stairs both of us remembered the same thing that it was tish's day to use the basement laundry and that perhaps tish was not in the laundry nor was hannah her maid but tish's blue and white dressing sack was on the line and the blue had run as i had said it would when she bought it in the furnace room beyond we heard voices and aggie opened the door tish and hannah were both there they had not heard us nonsense tish was saying if anybody had been hit we'd have heard a scream or if they were killed we'd have heard em fall i heard a sort of yell said poor hannah i don't like it miss tish the time before you just missed me why did you stick your arm out demanded tish now take that broomstick and we'll start again did you score that how'll i score it asked hannah hit or miss she went to the cellar wall and stood waiting with a piece of charcoal in her hand the whitewashed wall was marked with rows of x's and ciphers the ciphers predominated mark it a miss but i heard a yell fiddle dee dee are you ready tish had lifted a small rifle into position and was standing with her feet apart pointing it at a white target hanging by a string from a rafter as she gave the signal hannah sighed and picking up a broom handle started the target to swaying pendulum fashion tish followed it with the gun i thought things had gone far enough so i stepped into the cellar and spoke in ringing tones letitia carberry i said sternly tish pulled the trigger at that moment and the bullet went into the furnace pipe it was absurd of course for tish to blame me for it but she turned on me in a rage look what you made me do she snapped can't a person have a moment's privacy what i think you need i retorted is six months complete seclusion in a sanitarium you nearly shot us in the upper hall aggie put in warmly well as long as i didn't shoot you in the upper hall or any other place i guess you needn't fuss said tish ready hannah this time she shot hannah in the broom handle and practically put her hors de combat but the shot immediately after was what tish triumphantly called a clean bull's-eye that is it hit the centre of the target that is the time to stop when one has made a bull's-eye in any sort of achievement i take it and tish is nobody's fool she took off her spectacles and wiped the perspiration and gunpowder streaks from her face she was immediately in high good humour every unprotected female should know how to handle a weapon she said oracularly and sitting down on the edge of the coal bin proceeded to swab out the gun with a wad of cotton on the end of a stick the poker has been good enough for you for fifty years i retorted and if you think you look sporty or anything but idiotic sitting there in a flowered kimono and swabbing out the throat of that gun just then the janitor came down and tish gave him a dollar for the use of the cellar it did not mention the furnace pipe aggie and i glanced at each other tish's demoralization had begun from that minute to the long and entirely false story she told the red-bearded man in thundercloud glen several days later she trod as aggie truthfully said the downward path of mendacity bringing up in the county jail and hysterics we went upstairs tish ahead and aggie and i two flights behind believing that tish with an unloaded gun was a thousand times more dangerous than any outlaw with an entire arsenal loaded to the muzzle we had a cup of tea in tish's parlor but she kept us out of the bedroom where we could hear miss swift running the sewing machine finally aggie set out of a clear sky 
have you had any answers to your advertisement tish who had been about to put a slice of lemon in her tea put it in her mouth instead and stared at us both what advertisement we know all about it tish i said and if you think it proper for a woman of your age to go adventuring with only a donkey for company i've had worse tish snapped and i'm not feeble yet as far as my age goes if i want to take a walking tour it's my affair isn't it you can't walk with your bad knee i objected tish sniffed you're envious that's what she sneered while you are sitting at home overeating and oversleeping and getting fat in mind and body i shall be on the broad highway walking between hedgerows of flowering flowering well between hedgerows while you sleep in stuffy upholstered rooms i shall lie in woodland glades in my sleeping bag and see overhead the constellation of uh, of what's its name i shall talk to the birds and the birds will talk to me sleeping bag that was what aggie had meant that miss swift was making what are you going to do when it rains it doesn't rain much in may anyhow a friendly farmhouse and a glass of milk even a barn aggie got up with the light of desperation in her eyes aggie hates woods and gnats has no eye for nature and for almost half a century has pampered her body in a feather-bed poultice with the windows closed until the first of june each year yet aggie rose to the crisis you shan't go alone tish she said stoutly you'll forget to change your stockings when your feet are wet and you can't make a cup of coffee fit to drink i'm going too tish made a gesture of despair but aggie was determined tish glanced at me well she snapped we might as well make it a family excursion aren't you coming along too to look after aggie not at all i observed calmly i'll have enough to do looking after myself but i like the idea and since you've invited me i'll come of course at first i am afraid tish was not particularly pleased she said she had it all planned to make four miles an hour or about forty miles a day and that any one falling back would have to be left by the wayside and that if we were not prepared to sleep on the ground or were going to talk rheumatism every time she found a place to camp she would thank us to remember that we had really asked ourselves but she grew more cheerful finally and seemed to be glad to talk over the details of the trip with somebody she said it was a pity we had not had some practice with firearms for we would each have to take a weapon the mountains being full of outlaws more than likely neither aggie nor i could use a gun at all but as tish observed we could pot at trees and fence posts along the road by way of practice when i suggested that the side of three women of our age we are all well on toward fifty aggie insists that she is younger than i am but we were in the same infant class in sunday school three women of our age potting at fences was hardly dignified tish merely shrugged her shoulders she asked us not to let charlie sands learn of the trip he would be sure to be fussy and want to send a man along and that would spoil it all what with the secrecy and the guns and everything i dare say we were like a lot of small boys getting ready to run away out west and kill indians in fact tish said it reminded her of the time years ago when charlie sands and some other boys had run away with all the carving knives and razors they could gather together and were found a week later in a cave in the mountains twenty miles or so from town tish showed us her sleeping bag which was felt outside and her old white fur rug within aggie planned hers immediately on the same lines with her fur coat as a lining but i had mine made of oilcloth outside my rheumatism having warned me that we were going to have rain i was right about the rain i had an old army revolver that had belonged to my father and of course tish had her coal cellar rifle but aggie had nothing more dangerous than a bayonet from the mexican war this being too heavy to carry and dull being only possible as a weapon 
by bringing the handle down on one's opponent's head aggie was forced to buy a revolver the man in the shop tried to sell her a small pearl-handled one but she would not look at it she bought one of the sort that goes on shooting as long as one holds a finger on the trigger a snub-nosed thing that looked as deadly as it was she was in terror of it from the moment she got it home and during most of the trip it was packed in excelsior with the barrel stuffed with cotton on modestine's back which brings me to modestine tish received three answers to her advertisement one was a mule one a piebald pony with a wicked eye and the third was a donkey it seemed that stevenson had said that the pack animal of such a trip should be cheap small and hardy and that a donkey best of all answered these requirements the donkey in question was however not a female tish was firm about this but on no more donkeys being offered she bought this one and called him modestine anyhow he was very dirty and we paid a dollar extra to have him washed with soap powder as our food was to be carried on his back also the day before we started i spent an hour or so on him with a fine comb with gratifying results i must confess i entered on the adventure with a light heart tish had apparently given up all thought of the aeroplane her automobile was being used by charlie sands the weather was warm and sunny and the orchards were in bloom i had no premonition of danger the adventure reduced to its elements of canned food alcohol lamp sleeping bags and toothbrushes seemed no adventure at all but a peaceful and pastoral excursion by three middle-aged women into green fields and pastures new we reckoned however without aggie's missionary dime aggie's church had sent each of its members a ten-cent piece with instructions to invest it in some way and to return it multiplied as much as possible in three months this was on aggie's mind but we did not know it until later really aggie's missionary dime is the story if she had done as she had planned at first and invested it in an egg had hatched the egg in cotton wool on the shelf over her kitchen range and raised the chicken eventually selling the chicken to herself for dinner at seventy-five cents this story would never have been written what the dime really bought was a glass of jelly wrapped in a two-day old newspaper but to go back we were to start from tish's at dawn on tuesday morning modestine's former owner had agreed to bring him at that hour to the alley behind tish's apartment on monday aggie and i sent over what we felt we could not get along without and about five we both arrived tish was sitting on the floor with luggage scattered all round her and heaped on the chairs in bed she looked up witheringly when we entered you forgot your opera cloak lizzie she said and aggie has only sent five pairs of shoes i've got to have shoes aggie protested if you've got to have five pairs of shoes six white petticoats summer underwear intermediates and flannels a bathrobe six bath towels and a sunshade not to mention other things you want an elephant not a donkey why do we have a donkey i asked why don't we have a horse and buggy and go like christians because you and aggie wouldn't walk if we did snapped tish i know you both you'd have rheumatism or a corn and you'd take your walking trip sitting besides we may not always keep to the roads i'd like to go up into the mountains well tish was disagreeable but right as it turned out the donkey being small could only carry the sleeping bags our portable stove and the provisions we each were obliged to pack a suitcase and carry that we started at dawn the next day hannah came down to the alley and didn't think much of modestine by the time he was loaded a small crowd had gathered and when we finally started off tish ahead with modestine's bridle over her arm and aggie and i behind with our suitcases a sort of cheer went up 
it was however an orderly leave-taking perhaps owing to the fact that tish's rifle was packed in full view on modestine's back i have a great admiration for tish she does not fear the pointing figure of a scorn she took the most direct route out of town and by the time we had reached the outskirts we had a string of small boys behind us like the tail of a kite when we reached the cemetery and sat down to rest they formed a circle round us and stared at us tish looked at her watch we had been an hour and twenty minutes going two miles End of part one. Part two of The Cave on Thundercloud by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part two. We were terribly thirsty, but none of us cared to drink from the cemetery well in fact the question of water bothered us all that day it was very warm and after we left the suburban trolley line where motormen stopped the cars to look at us and people crowded to the porches to stare at us the water question grew serious tish had studied sanitation and at every farm we came to the well was improperly located generally it was immediately below the pigsty luckily we had brought along some blackberry cordial and we took a sip of that now and then but the suitcases were heavy and at eleven o'clock aggie said the cordial had gone to her head and she could go no farther tish was furious i told you how it would be she said for about forty years you haven't used your legs except to put shoes and stockings on of course they won't carry you it isn't my feet it's my head aggie sniffed if i had some water i'd be all right if you're going to examine everything you drink with the microscope you might as well have stayed home i'd have died before i drank out of that last well snapped tish one could tell by looking at that woman that there are dead rats and things in the water you are not so particular at home aggie asserted you use vinegar don't you and i'm sure it's full of wrigglers you can see them when you hold the cruet to the light we got her to go on finally and at the next well we boiled a pailful of water and made some tea we found a grove beside the road and built a fire in our stove there and while modestine was grazing we sat and soaked our feet in a brook and looked for blisters tish calculated that as we had been walking for six hours we'd probably gone twenty-two miles but i believe it was about eight while we drank our tea and ate the luncheon hannah had put up we discussed our plans tish's original scheme had been to follow the donkey but as he would not move without some one ahead leading him this was not feasible we want to keep away from the beaten path tish said with a pickle in one hand and her cup in the other these days automobiles go everywhere i'm in favor of heading straight for the mountain i am not i said firmly here in civilization we can find a barn on a rainy night there are plenty of caves in the mountains said tish besides to get the real benefit of this we ought to sleep out rain or shine a gentle spring rain hurts no one we rested for two hours it was very pleasant modestine ate all that was left of the luncheon and aggie took a nap with her head on her suitcase if we had not had the suitcases we should have been quite contented tish with her customary ability solved that we need only one suitcase she declared we can leave the other two at this farmhouse and pack a few things for each of us in the one we take along then we can take turns carrying it aggie wakened finally and was rather more docile about the suitcases than we had expected possibly she would have been more indignant but her feet had swollen so while she had her shoes off that she could hardly get them on at all and for the remainder of the day her mind was you may say in her feet at four we stopped again and made more tea 
the road had begun to rise toward the hills and the farmhouses were fewer ahead of us loomed thunder cloud mountain with the camel's back to the right of it the road led up the valley between it was hardly a road at all being a grass-grown wagon track with not a house in a mile aggie was glad of the grass for she had taken off her shoes by that time and was carrying them slung over her shoulder on the end of her parasol we were on the lower slope of the mountain when we heard the green automobile it was coming rapidly from behind us aggie had just time to sit on a bank at her feet before it came in sight it was a long low bright green car and there were four men in it they were bent forward looking ahead except one man who sat so he could see behind him they came on us rather suddenly and the man who was looking back yelled to us as they passed but what with noise and dust i couldn't make out what he said the next moment the machine flew ahead and out of sight among the trees what did he say i asked aggie who has a tendency to a hay fever was sneezing in the dust i don't know returned tish absently staring after them probably asked us if we wanted a ride lizzie those men had guns fiddlesticks i said guns repeated tish firmly well what of it our donkey has a gun and as at that instant the sleeping bags and provisions slid gently round under modestine's stomach the green automobile and its occupants passed out of our minds for a while by the time we had got the things on modestine's back again we were convinced he had been a mistake he objected to standing still to be reloaded and even with tish at his head and aggie at his tail he kept turning in a circle and in fact finally kicked out at aggie and stretched her in the road then too his back was not flat like a horse's it went up to a sort of peak and was about as handy to pack things on as the ridge-pole of a roof for an hour or so more we plodded on tish who is an enthusiast about anything she does kept pointing out wildflowers to us and talking about the unfortunates back in town under roofs but i kept thinking of a broiled lamb chop with new potatoes and my whole being revolted at the thought of supper out of a can at twilight we found a sort of recess in the valley level and not too thickly wooded and while tish and i set up the stove and lighted a fire aggie spread out the sleeping bags and got supper ready we had canned salmon and potato salad we ate ravenously and then taking off our shoes and our walking suits and getting into our flannel kimonos and putting up our crimps for we were determined not to lapse into slovenly personal habits we were ready for the night tish said there were all sorts of animals on thunder cloud so we built a large fire to keep them away tish said this was the customary thing being done in all the adventure books she had read aggie had to be helped into her sleeping bag her fur coat having been rather skimp but once in she said it was heavenly and she was asleep almost immediately tish and i followed and i found i had placed my bag over a stone i was however too tired to get up i lay and looked at the stars twinkling above the treetops and i felt sorry for people who had nothing better to look at than a wallpaper ceiling tish next to me was yawning if there are snakes she observed drowsily they are not poisonous i should think and anyhow no snake could strike through these heavy bags she went to sleep at once but i lay there thinking of snakes for some time also i remembered that we'd forgotten to leave our weapons within reach although as far as that goes i should not have slept a wink had aggie had her fourth of july celebration near at hand then i went to sleep the last thing i remember was wishing we had brought a dog even a box of cigars would have been some protection we could have lighted one and stuck it in the crotch of a tree as if a man was mounting guard over the camp this idea of course was not original it was done first by mr sherlock holmes the detective it must have been toward dawn that i roused with a feeling that someone was looking down at me 
the fire was very low and aggie was sleeping with her mouth open i got up on my elbow and stared round there was nothing in sight but through the trees i heard a rustling of leaves and the crackling of brushwood whatever it was it had gone i turned over and before long went to sleep again at daylight i was roused by raindrops splashing on my face i sat up hastily aggie was sleeping with the flap of her bag over her head and tish under an umbrella was sitting fully dressed on a log poring over her road map when i sat up she glanced over at me i think i know where we are now lizzie she said thundercloud mountain is on our left and that hill there to the right is the camel's back the road goes right up thundercloud glen i looked at the fire which was out at modestine standing meekly by the tree to which he was tied at the raindrops bounding off aggie's round and prostrate figure and i rebelled every muscle was sore it hurt me even to yawn letitia carberry i said indignantly you don't mean to tell me that rain or no rain you are going on certainly i am going on said tish shutting her jaw you and aggie needn't come i'm sure you asked yourselves i didn't well that was true of course i crawled out and going over prodded at aggie with my foot aggie i said it is raining and tish is going on anyhow will you go on with her or start back home with me but aggie refused to do either she was terribly stiff and she had slept near a bed of may apple blossoms in the twilight she had not noticed them and they always bring her hay fever i'm going to stay right here she said firmly between sneezes you can't go back or forward or whatever you please i shan't move tish was marking out a route on the road map by making holes with a hairpin and now she got up and faced us very well she said then get your things out of the suitcase which happens to be mine lizzie the canned beans and the sardines are yours aggie your potato salad is in those six screw-top jars come modestine she untied the beast and leading him over loaded her sleeping-bag and her share of the provisions on his back she did not glance at us at last when she was ready she picked up her rifle and turned to us i may not be back for a week or ten days she said icily if i'm longer than two weeks you can start charlie sands out with a posse charlie sands is her nephew come modestine said tish again and started along it was raining briskly by that time and thundering as if a storm was coming aggie broke down suddenly tish tish she wailed oh lizzie she'll never get back alive never we've killed her she's about killed us i snarled she's coming back sure enough tish had turned and was stalking back in our direction i ought to leave you where you are she said disagreeably but it's going to storm if you decide to be sensible somewhere up in the valley is the cave charlie sands hid in when he ran away i think i can find it it was thundering louder now and aggie was giving a squeal with every peal we were too far gone for pride i helped her out of her sleeping bag and we started after tish and the donkey the rain poured down on us at every step torrents from thundercloud and the camel's back soaked us the wind howled up the ravine and the lightning played round the treetops we travelled for three hours in that downpour End of part two part three of the cave on thundercloud by mary roberts reinhardt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part three only once did tish speak and then we could hardly hear her above the rush of water and the roar of the wind there's one comfort she said wading along knee-deep in a torrent these spring rains give nobody cold an hour later she spoke again but that was at the end of that journey i don't believe this is the right valley after all she said i don't see any cave we stopped to take our bearings 
as you may say and as we stood there looking up i could have sworn that i saw a man with a gun peering down at us from a ledge far above but the next moment he was gone and neither tish nor aggie had seen him at all we found the cave soon after and climbed to it on our hands and knees pulling modestine up by his bridle a more outrageous quartet it would have been impossible to find or a more outraged one aggie let down her dress which she had pinned round her waist releasing about a quart of water from its folds and stood looking about her with a sneer i don't think much of your cave she said it's little and it's dirty it's dry said tish tartly why stop it all aggie said sarcastically why not just have kept on we couldn't get any wetter yes i added between flowering hedgerows and of course these spring rains give nobody cold tish did not say a word she took off her shoes and her skirt got her sleeping bag off modestine's back and went to bed with the worst attack of neuralgia she had ever had that was on wednesday late in the afternoon it rained for two days we built a fire out of the wood that was in the cave and dried out our clothes and heated stones to put against tish's right eye and brought in wet branches to dry against the time when we should need them aggie sneezed incessantly in the smoke and tish groaned in her corner i was about crazy on thursday when the edge of the neuralgia was gone tish promised to go home the moment the rain stopped and the roads dried aggie and i went to her together and implored her but as it turned out we did not go home for some days and when we did by thursday evening tish was much better she ate a little potato salad and we sat round the fire listening to her telling how they had found the runaways in this very cave they had taken all the hatchets and kitchen knives they could find and started to hunt indians she was saying they got as far as this cave and one evening about this time they were sitting round the fire like this when a black bear we all heard it at the same moment something was scrambling and climbing up the mountainside to the cave tish had her rifle to her shoulder in a second and aggie shut her eyes but it was not a bear that appeared at the mouth of the cave and stood blinking in the light it was a young man i beg your pardon he said peering into the firelight but you don't happen to have a spare box of matches do you tish lowered the rifle matches she said why um, certainly aggie give the gentleman some matches the young man had edged into the cave by that time and we saw that he was limping and leaning on a stick he looked round the cave approvingly at our three sleeping bags in an orderly row with our toilet things set out on a clean towel on a flat stone and a mirror hung above and at our lantern on another stone with magazines and books grouped round it aggie finding some trailing arbutus just outside the cave that day had got two or three empty salmon cans about filled with it and the fur rug from tish's sleeping bag lay in front of the fire the effect was really civilized it looks like a drawing room said the young man with a long breath it's the first dry spot i've seen for two days and it looks like heaven to a lost soul where are you stopping i am not stopping i am on a walking tour or was until i hurt my leg don't you think you'd better wait until things dry up and starve he asked the woods are full of nuts and berries said tish not in may and there is plenty of game yes if one has a weapon he replied i lost my gun when i fell into thunder creek in fact i lost everything except my good name what's that thing of shakespeare's who steals my purse steals trash but he aggie found the matches just then and gave him a box he was almost pathetically grateful tish was still staring at him to find on thunder cloud mountain a young man who quoted shakespeare and had lost everything but his good name even stevenson could hardly have had a more unusual adventure 
what are you going to do with the matches she demanded as he limped to the cave mouth light a fire if i can find any wood dry enough to light if i can't well you remember the little match seller in hans christian anderson's story who warmed her fingers with her own matches until they were all gone and she froze to death hans christian anderson and shakespeare can't you find a cave asked tish i had a cave he said but but what three charming women found it while i was out on the mountainside they needed the shelter more than i and so what tish exclaimed this is your cave not at all it is yours the fact that i had been stopping in it gave me no right that i was not happy to wave there was nothing of yours in it tish said suspiciously as i have told you i have lost everything but my good name and my sprained ankle i had them both out with me when you we will leave immediately said tish aggie bring modestine ladies ladies cried the young man would you make me more wretched than i already am i assure you if you leave i shall not come back i should be too unhappy well nothing could have been fairer than his attitude he wished us to stay on but as he limped a step or two into the night aggie turned on us both in a fury that's it she said let him go of course so long as you are dry and comfortable it doesn't matter about him well you are dry and comfortable too snapped tish what do you expect us to do call him back let him sleep here by the fire give him something to eat he looks starved if you're afraid it isn't proper we can hang our kimonos up for curtains and make him a separate room but we did not need to call him he had limped back and stood in the firelight again you you haven't seen anything of the bandits have you he asked bandits train robbers i thought you had probably run across them all at once we remembered the green automobile and the four men with guns we told him about it and he nodded that would be they he said as tish remarked later we knew from that instant that he was a gentleman even charlie sands would probably have said them they got away very rapidly and i dare say an automobile would be did one of them have a red beard yes we told him the one who called to us well he said that on monday night an express car on the c and l railroad had been held up the pursuit had gone in another direction but he was convinced from what we said that they were there in thunder cloud glen as tish said the situation was changed if there were outlaws about we were three defenseless women and here was a man brought providentially to us she asked him at once to join our party and look after us until we got to civilization again or at least until the roads were dry enough to travel on to look after you he said with a smile i with a bad leg and no weapon at that aggie brought out her new revolver and gave it to him he whistled when he looked at it great scott he said what a weapon for a woman why you don't need any help you could kill all the outlaws in the county at one loading but finally he consented to take the revolver and even to accept the shelter of the cave for the night anyhow although we had to beg him to do that how do you know i'll not get up in the night and take all your valuables and gallop away on your trusty steed before morning he asked we'll take a chance tish said dryly in the first place we have nothing more valuable than the portable stove and in the second place if you can make modestine gallop you may have him it is curious when i look back to think how completely he won us all he was young not more than twenty-six i think and dressed for a walking tour in knickerbockers with a blue flannel shirt heavy low shoes and a soft hat his hands were quite white he kept running them over his chin which was bluish as if a day or two's beard was bothering him we asked him if he was hungry and he admitted that he could hardly remember when he had eaten so we made him some tea and buttered toast and opened and heated a can of baked beans he ate them all 
good gracious he said with the last spoonful what a world it would be without women at that he fell into a sort of study looking at the fire and we all saw that he looked sad again and rather forlorn yes tish said you're all ready enough to shout beware of women until you are hungry or uncomfortable or hurt and then you are all just little boys again crying for somebody to kiss the bump but when it is a woman who has given the her bump he asked aggie is romantic years ago she was engaged to a mr wiggins a roofer who met with an accident due to an icy roof she leaned forward and looked at him with sympathy that's it is it she asked gently he tried to smile but we could all see that he was suffering yes that's it partly at least he said that is if it were not for a woman he stopped abruptly but why should i bother you with my troubles we were curious of course but it is hardly good taste to ask a man to confide his heartaches as tish said the best cure for a masculine heartache is to make the man comfortable we did all we could i dried his coat by the fire and tish made hot arnica compresses for his ankle which was blue and swollen i believe aggie would gladly have sat by and held his hand but he crawled into his shell of reserve again and would not be coaxed out i have a nephew about your age tish said when he objected to her bathing his ankle i'm doing for you what i should do for charlie sands under the same circumstances charlie sands he said and i was positive he started but he said nothing and we only remembered that later we were glad to have a man about heaven only knows why women persist in regarding men as absolute protection against fire burglars and lightning but they do a sharp storm came up at that time and ordinarily aggie would have been in her sleeping bag with modestine's saddle on top by way of extra protection but now from sheer bravado she went to the mouth of the cave and stood looking out at the lightning come and look at it tish she said it's good gracious there's a man across the valley with a gun we all ran to the mouth of the cave except the walking tour gentleman who had his foot in a collapsible basin of arnica and hot water but none of us saw aggie's man when we went back wouldn't it be better to darken things up a bit he suggested if there are bandits round it isn't necessary to send out a welcome to them you know this seemed only sensible we put the fire out and sat in the warm darkness and that was when our gentleman told his story ladies he began in saying that i am on a walking tour i am telling the truth but only part of the truth i am on a walking tour but not for pleasure to be frank i i am after the outlaws who robbed the express car on the c and l railroad monday night i heard aggie gasp in the dark did you expect to capture them with a walking stick tish demanded she might treat his ankle as she would treat charlie sand's ankle but tish has not aggie's confidence in people or mine perfectly well taken he said good-humouredly i left home with an entire arsenal in my knapsack but as i say i lost everything when i fell into the flooded creek everything that is but my good name aggie suggested timidly determination that i still have ladies i'm not going back empty-handed then you are in the government service tish asked with more respect have you ever heard of george muldoon generally known as felt hat muldoon had we weren't the papers full of him week after week wasn't it muldoon who had brought back the communion service to my church with nothing missing and only a dent in one of the silver pitchers hadn't he just sent up tish's own italian fruit dealer for writing blackhand letters wasn't he the best sheriff the county had ever had muldoon gasped tish you muldoon not to-night or for the next two or three days after that to-night ladies and for a day or two why not adopt me to be your nephew what was his name sands accompanying you on a walking tour adopt him the great muldoon we'd have married him if he had said the word 
name and all we sat back and stared at him open-mouthed to think that he had come to us for help and that in aiding him we were furthering the cause of justice he talked for quite a long time in the darkness telling us of his adventures he remembered perfectly about getting back the silver for the church and about Titian's italian and then at last finding us good listeners he told about the girl is it uh, money aggie breathlessly asked well partly he admitted i don't make much of course but with the rewards and all that asked aggie who'd been sitting forward with her mouth open rewards oh well of course i get something that way but it isn't steady money a chap can't very well go to a girl's father and tell him that if somebody murders somebody else and escapes and he captures him he can pay the rent and the grocery bill is she pretty asked aggie beautiful his tone was ardent enough to please even aggie he sat without speaking for a time and none of us liked to interrupt him outside it had stopped raining and the moon was coming up over the camel's back we could hear modestine stirring in the thicket and a watery ray of moonlight came into the cave and threw our shadows against the wall if only said sheriff muldoon thoughtfully if only i could get my hands on that chap with a red beard we all went to bed soon after aggie as usual went to sleep at once and soon from behind the kimono screen across the cave loud noises told us that mr muldoon also slept it was then that tish crept over and put her mouth to my ear that may be muldoon all right she whispered but if it is he's got a wife and two children mrs muldoon is related to hannah End of part three Part four of The Cave at Thundercloud by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part four. Somehow, with the morning, our suspicions, if we had any, vanished. Mr. Muldoon had been up at dawn, and when we wakened, he had already brought water from a nearby spring and was boiling some in the tea kettle seen by daylight he was very good-looking he had blue eyes with black lashes and dark brown hair and a habit of getting up when any of us did that kept him on his feet most of the time his limp was rather better or his ankle that's what a little mothering has done for me he said gaily over his coffee and mackerel it's a long time since i've had anyone to do anything like that for me but surely your wife began tish he started and changed color we all saw it my wife you've got a wife and two children haven't you he looked at us all and drew a long breath ladies he said i see some of my painful history is known to you may i ask is it too much to beg that that we do not discuss that part of my life tish apologized at once we could not tell from what he said whether he had been divorced or had lost them all from scarlet fever whichever it was i must say he was not depressed for very long although he had reason enough for depression as we soon learned it's like this he said they know i'm here in the glen the outlaws i mean the red-bearded man naismith has sworn to get me get you from aggie shoot me the other three all owe me grudges too but naismith's the worst he's just out of the pen i got him a ten-year sentence for this very thing robbing an express car ten years i exclaimed you look as if you hadn't shaved in ten years he looked at me and smiled i'm older than you think he said and anyhow he got a lot off for good behavior it's outrageous the discount that's given to a criminal for behaving himself he got i think i am right when i say yes he was sent up in o seven he got seven years off his sentence we all thought that this was a grave mistake and tish whose father was once warden of the penitentiary observed that there was nothing like that in old times and she would write to the governor about it tish has written to the governor several times 
the last occasion being the rise in price of brooms it's like this said mr muldoon they've got the glen guarded there's a man at each end and the rest are covering the hilltops a squirrel couldn't get out without their knowledge i might have before i got this leg but now i'm done for oh no we chorused it amounts to that he said dejectedly they've been watching you women and they're not afraid of you as long as i stay in the cave here i'm safe enough but let me poke my nose out and i'm gone it's an awful thing to have to hide behind a woman's petticoats we could only silently sympathize it was bright and clear that day the sun came out and tried the road below it would have been a wonderful day to go on but none of us thought of it as tish said here was a chance to assist the law and a fellow being in peril of his life our place was there even had we doubted mr muldoon's story we had proof of it before noon a man with a gun came out on a ledge of rock across the valley and stood with his hands to his eyes peering across at our cave tish was hanging some of our clothing out to dry and although she saw the outlaw as well as we did she did not flinch after a time the man seemed satisfied and disappeared tish came into the cave then and took a spoonful of blackberry cordial as we knew her intrepid spirit had not quailed but as she said one's body is never as strong as one's soul her knees were shaking we put in a quiet and restful afternoon mr muldoon had a pack of cards with him and we played whist he played a very fair game but he was on the alert all the time at every sound he started and once or twice he slipped out into the thicket and searched the glen in every direction with his eyes he had asked us if the outlaws surprised us to say that he was tish's nephew charlie sands and to stick to it unless it's naysmith he said he knows me from that to calling us aunt tish aunt aggie and aunt lizzie was very easy at four o'clock we stopped playing with mr muldoon easily the winner and aggie made fudge for everybody late in the afternoon tish called me aside she said she did not want mr muldoon to feel that he was a burden but that we were almost out of provisions we had expected to buy eggs milk and bread at farmhouses and instead we had been shut up in the cave she thought there was a farm up the glen having heard a cowbell and she wanted me to go and find out go yourself i said somewhat rudely if you want to be shot down in your tracks by outlaws well and good i don't aggie called aside refused as firmly as i had tish stood and looked at us both with her lip curling very well she said coldly i shall go but if i get my neuralgia again from wading through the creek bottom don't blame me she put on her overshoes and taking a tin bucket for milk and her trusty rifle she started while mr muldoon was showing aggie a new game of solitaire i went to the cave mouth with her and listened to the crackling of twigs as she slid down into the valley she came into view at the bottom much sooner than i had expected having as i learned later slipped on a loose stone and rolled fully half the way down the next two hours seemed endless mr muldoon tiring of solitaire had rolled himself up in a corner and was peacefully sleeping with his injured foot on aggie's hot pillow aggie and i sat on guard one on each side of the cave mouth and stared down at the valley which was darkening rapidly tish had been gone two hours and a half and no sign of her when aggie began to cry softly she'll never come back she whimpered the outlaws have got her and killed her oh tish tish why would they kill her i demanded because she's trying to buy milk and eggs but because she knows too much aggie wailed we've found their lair that's why don't tell me this isn't an outlaw's cave it's just b built for it they'll do away with her and then they'll come after us aggie never carries a secret weight in her bosom 
she always opens up her heart to the nearest listener this probably relieves aggie but it does not make her a cheerful companion eight o'clock and darkness came and still no tish i went into the cave and brought out my gun and aggie roused mr muldoon and explained the situation to him he grew quite white good heavens he exclaimed what possessed her anyhow to the farmhouse why they'll his face more than his words convinced us that the matter was really serious he examined aggie's revolver which he mostly carried in his hip pocket and going to the mouth of the cave listened carefully everything was quiet the cave and both sides of the valley were in deep shadow but over the ridge of the camel's back across from us there was still a streak of red sunset light mr muldoon looked and pointed against the background of crimson cloud a man's figure stood out clearly he was peering down toward us although in the dusk he could hardly have seen us and he carried a gun mr muldoon smiled faintly well they've spotted me i guess he said i'd better move on before i get you into trouble they won't hurt women why don't you shoot him aggie asked it would be one bandit less if you do arrest him and he gets nearly all his sentence off for good behavior he'll be out again in no time doing more mischief but at that moment we saw the man on the hill throw his gun to his shoulder and aim at something moving below in the valley aggie screamed and i believe i did also tish cried aggie he's shooting at tish and at that instant the bandit fired he fired three times and the noise of his gun echoed backward and forward among the hills we thought we heard a yell from the valley then the next second there was a faint crack from below and the outlaw's gun flew out of his hands mr muldoon's jaw dropped did you see that he said feebly did you see that shot the outlaw disappeared from the skyline and perhaps ten minutes later tish crawled up to the cave and put down a tin pail full of milk a glass of jelly wrapped in a newspaper and a basket of eggs aggie fell on her and cried with joy be careful of those eggs tish warned her that outlaw charged me forty cents a dozen you gave him a good fright anyhow said aggie fondly fright when you shot at him oh that one i'm talking about the woman at the farm and the one on the hill over there oh well he fired at me and i fired back that's all with an air of exaggerated indifference tish swaggered into the cave and took off her overshoes hurry up supper ag she said never before or since has she called aggie ag i'm starving she said she had heard little or nothing she had found the farmhouse had bought her supplies from a surly woman and had come away again asked by mr muldoon if she had seen any men she said she had seen a farmhand milking that was all except the outlaw on the hill but under her calmness tish was terribly excited i could tell it by her glittering eyes and the red spot in each cheek manlike mr muldoon did not see these signs he ate very little and sat watching her fascinated only once however did he broach the subject i had no idea you were such a shot miss letitia he said it that was a marvel oh i shoot a little said tish coolly only for my amusement of course mr muldoon made no reply he was very thoughtful all evening did not care to play whist and watched tish whenever he could furtively tish herself was in an exalted mood but not about the shot she was modest enough about that and with cause months after she told us how it happened she said she was carrying the eggs and milk with her left hand and had the gun in her right when a shot struck a tree beside her she was so startled that her finger pulled the trigger of her own rifle which was pointed up with the result we know of she would probably never have confessed even then had she not taken rheumatic fever and thought she was dying when mr muldoon went out to fix modestine for the night tish called us to the back of the cave 
i bought the milk and eggs she said hurriedly and having a dime left your missionary dime aggie i borrowed it i went back and bought a glass of jelly men like preserves the woman wrapped it in a newspaper and there is a full account of the robbery and of muldoon being after the outlaws he's after the outlaws but he's after the reward too they're quoted at a thousand dollars he can have the thousand dollars for all of me said aggie a thousand dollars said tish a thousand dollars to hand in to the church as the return from your missionary dime and if we don't get it muldoon will as soon as he can get about on his leg he'll cease being hunted and begin to hunt why should he have it he has plenty of chances and we'll never have another that was all she had a chance to say muldoon joining us at that moment we retired early but i did not sleep well i wakened from time to time and i could hear tish stirring next to me at last i reached over and touched her can't you sleep i whispered don't want to she whispered back i've got it all fixed lizzie we'll take those outlaws back to the city roped two by two it was a cool spring night but i broke into a hot perspiration End of part four part five of the cave on thundercloud by mary roberts reinhardt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 5 Tish began with Mr. Muldoon the next morning. He could not leave the cave to carry up water, for daylight revealed another guard across the valley, and it was clear we were being watched. While Aggie and I went to the spring, Tish talked to him. She told him that he had undertaken too much, single-handed, and that he should have brought a posse with him he agreed with her he said that he had started with a posse but that they had split up also he insisted that but for his accident he could have managed easily i'm up against it he said and i know it they'll get me yet for the last day or two they've been closing up round this cave and in a night or two they'll rush it they've got their headquarters at that farmhouse the thing for you to do then said tish is to get out while there is time you can get help and come back and leave you women here alone they're not after us tish replied and we've managed alone for a good many years i guess we'll get along but when she proposed her plan which was that he should put on aggie's spare outfit and her sun veil and ride out of the valley on modestine's back in daylight he objected he said no outlaw worthy of the name would fall for a thing like that and he said he wouldn't wear skirts and that was all there was to it but in the end tish prevailed as usual i'm going to the farmhouse this morning and i am going to say that one of the ladies is leaving this afternoon and going back home that will be you i wish you had a razor but the veil will hide that they'll not molest you you'll not only look like aggie you'll be aggie well it seemed to be his best chance although none of us dared to think what might happen if the hat blew off or aggie's gray alpaca ripped at the seams we worked feverishly all day letting out the dress and setting forward the buttons on her raincoat mr muldoon was inclined to be sulky he sat at the back of the cave playing solitaire and every now and then examining the road maps aggie was depressed too but as tish said getting rid of muldoon was the first step toward the thousand dollars and even if aggie never got her gray alpaca again it had seen its best days that morning while aggie and i sewed and ripped and mr muldoon sat back in the cave with the road map on his knees tish went to the farmhouse she came back at eleven o'clock with a chicken for dinner and a flush on each cheek i fixed it mr muldoon she said i talked to one of the outlaws what screeched aggie he'd come in for something to eat the red-bearded one we had quite a chat i told him we were traveling like stevenson with a donkey but that one of the ladies had an abscess on a tooth and was going home 
he said it was no place for women and offered himself as an escort mr muldoon groaned what am i going to do if one of them comes up and makes an ass of himself he demanded kiss him tish looked at him coldly you'll have your jaw tied up she said that will cover your chin and you needn't speak point to your jaw anyhow they'll not bother you i said the toothache had affected your disposition and we were just as glad you were going the red-haired man says he's got relatives near the mouth of the valley and you can stay there overnight one of the men folks pulls teeth in emergencies it is hard writing all this of tish to remember that she has always been a truthful woman as charlie sands said later when we told him the story and he had sat open-mouthed staring from one to the other of us no one knows what depths of mendacity lie behind the most virtuous countenance we started aggie off at two o'clock that afternoon sitting sideways on modestine jaw tied up veiled and sun-hatted with aggie's flowered silk bag hanging to one wrist and a lunch basket on the other arm tish and i saw her down the hill and kissed her good-bye this was tish's idea i thought it unnecessary but as a matter of fact no matter what charlie sands may say it was not a real kiss going as it did through a veil and a bandage the man with a gun watched her off and tish having waved her out of sight round a curve looked up at him and nodded far away as he was he saw that and swept his hat off with quite an air tish's plan was very simple she told us as we cleared up the cave after the day's excitement when i go for the evening milk she said i shall mention that we have a young man with us a stranger who has hurt his ankle and cannot walk and i'll ask for arnica that's all that's all aggie and i exclaimed together certainly that's all sometime tonight they'll rush the cave you're a fool said aggie shortly why demanded tish we won't be in it we'll be outside the moment they are in we'll start to shoot not one of them will dare to stick his nose out when we told this to charlie's hands he slid entirely off his chair and sat on the floor not really he kept saying over and over you dreamed it you must have a thing like that i hastened to explain tish planned it i said i remember him looking at tish who was crocheting as she told the story and moistening his lips he was quite green in color end of part five Part six of The Cave on Thundercloud by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Roy. Part six. Clipping from the morning news of May the seventh. Sheriff ambushed. Remarkable experience of Muldoon and party in Thundercloud Glen. An extraordinary state of affairs was discovered by the relief party of constables, city and county detectives, and state constabulary sent to the relief of Sheriff Muldoon and his posse, who have been on the track of the C&L train bandits since last Monday. The relief party was sent out in response to a telephone message from a farmhouse in Thunder Cloud Glen and transmitted from the farmer's line to a long-distance wire this message was to the effect that the sheriff and his posse shut in a cave were being held prisoners by the outlaws being shot at steadily and that so far every attempt at escape had been thwarted by the terrific fire of the bandits a relief party in automobiles was rushed at once to the scene thundercloud glen is a narrow valley between the camel's back and thundercloud mountain a mile or so from the entrance to the glen the road always bad and now almost washed away by the recent heavy rains became impassable the party abandoned the machines and in skirmish order proceeded up the glen within an hour's time firing was heard and the rescuers doubled their pace passing a bend in the valley the scene of the outrage lay spread before them 
on the left the low mouth of the cave and across the valley on a slope of the camel's back a faint cloud of smoke showing where the outlaws had their lair as the rescuers came in sight the firing ceased and an ominous stillness hung over the valley the relief expedition had been seen by the imprisoned party also muldoon's well-known soft felt hat tied to the end of a pole was thrust from the cave mouth and waved vigorously up and down showing that some of the imprisoned party still lived one solitary shot was aimed at the hat followed by profound quiet using every precaution deputy sheriff mulcahy deployed his men with the intention of closing in on the outlaws from all sides at the same time at this time an interesting interruption occurred from the underbrush at the foot of the camel's back emerged three elderly women their clothing in tatters and in the wildest excitement they insisted that the outlaws were in the cave and hysterical with fright from their terrible experience declared that they had been holding the bandits in check and demanded the reward for their capture they were rational enough in other ways and explained that they had been on a walking tour with a donkey there was however no donkey deputy sheriff mulcahy who was noted for his gallantry sent the three women to a safe place at the rear of the party and detailed a guard to make them comfortable it being thought possible that the women were accomplices of the outlaws precautions were also taken to prevent their escape no trace of the outlaws was found sheriff muldoon and his three deputies now enabled to leave the cave joined the searchers every inch of thunder cloud glen was searched but without result across from the cave mouth behind a heap of fallen rocks was found the spot from which the outlaws had been shooting the ground was trampled and the rock chipped by the return fire from the cave here too was found a new automatic revolver a small rifle and another gun of antique pattern in a crevice of rock was discovered a flowered silk bag containing various articles of feminine use including a packet of powders marked hay fever a small bottle labeled blackberry cordial and a dozen or so unexploded cartridges for the revolver convinced now that the three women were accomplices of the outlaws and this corroborated by sheriff muldoon's statement that he had positively seen one of the three women peering over the rock and aiming a rifle at him and that the same woman two days before had fired at him from the valley knocking his gun out of his hand deputy sheriff mulcahy promptly arrested the women and had them taken in an automobile to the city at the jail however it was discovered that an unfortunate error had been made and the ladies were released they went at once to their homes while their names have not been divulged it is reported that they are well known and highly esteemed members of the community and much sympathy has been expressed for their disagreeable experience up to a late hour last night no trace has been found of the outlaws it is believed that they have left thundercloud glen and have penetrated farther into the mountains charlie sands came for us at the jail he asked us no questions which i thought strange but he got a carriage and took us all to tish's he did not speak a word on the way except to ask us if we had no hats on tish's reply meekly that we had left them in the cave he said nothing more but sat looking like a storm until we drew up at the house i dare say we did look curious our clothes were torn and draggled and although we had washed at the jail we were still somewhat powdered streaked and grimy charlie sands led us into tish's parlor and shut the door then he turned and surveyed the three of us sit down he said grimly we sat he stood looking down at each of us in turn i'll hear the story in a minute he said still cold and disagreeable but first of all aunt tish i want to ask you if you realize that this last escapade of yours is a disgrace to the family nothing of the sort tish asserted with something of her old spirit it was all for aggie's missionary dime i-a moment he said holding up his hand i'm going to ask a question i'll listen after that did you or did you not hold up the c and l express car we were too astounded to speak 
because if you did he said missionary dime or no missionary dime i shall turn you over to the authorities i have gone through a lot with you aunt tish in the past year aggie and i expected to see tish rise in majesty and point him out of the room but to her amazement she broke down and cried no she said feebly we didn't rob the car but oh charlie charlie we nursed that wretch muldoon and fed him and sent him off on modestine and aggie's gray alpaca and he got away and if you say to go to jail i'll go muldoon the wretch who said he was muldoon the the train robber well it took hours to tell the story and when we had all finished and aggie had gone to bed in tish's spare room with hysteria and tish had gone to bed with tea and toast charlie sands was still walking up and down the parlor stopping now and then to mutter well i'll be and then going on with his pacing hannah brought me a cup of junket at eight o'clock for none of us had eaten dinner i was sitting there with a the cup in my lap when the doorbell rang charlie sands answered it it was a letter addressed to all three of us we called tish and aggie and they crept in very subdued and pallid charlie sands opened the letter and read it dear and charming ladies i am abject what can i say to you who have just come through such an experience on my account how can i apologize or explain especially as i am confused myself as to what really happened did muldoon actually attack the cave were you in it when he arrived or is it possible that with my foolish fabrication in your mind you attempted but that is absurd of course whatever occurred and however it occurred i am on my knees to you all even a real bandit would have been touched by your kindness and i am not a real bandit any more than i am a real sheriff i am an ordinary citizen usually a law-abiding citizen but as a result of a foolish wager at my club brought about by the ease with which numerous trains have been robbed recently i undertook to hold up a c and l train with an empty revolver and to evade capture for a certain length of time the first part was successful the train messenger on seeing my gun handed me without a word a fat package i had not asked for it it was a gift i do not even know what was in it the newspapers say it is money it might have been eggs as far as i know the second part would have been simple also had i not hurt my leg things were looking serious for me when you found me i shall never forget the cave or the omelets or the tea or the fudge i can never return your hospitalities but one thing i can do the express company offers a reward of a thousand dollars for my little package probably they are right and it is not eggs whatever it is it is buried under the tree where we tied our noble steed modestine please return the package and claim the reward if you have scruples against taking it remember that the express company is rich and the fiji islanders needy turn it in as the increased increment on miss aggie's missionary dime signed the outlaw of thunder cloud we found the package or charlie sands found it for us and the express company paid us the reward we gave it to aggie and with the exception of fifty dollars she turned it all in at the church where it created almost a riot with the fifty dollars we purchased through charlie sands a revolver with a silver inlaid handle and sent it to the real sheriff muldoon it eased our consciences somewhat that was all last spring it is summer now tish is talking again of flowering hedgerows and country lanes but aggie and i do not care for the country and the mere sight of a donkey gives me a chill yesterday evening on our way to prayer meeting we heard a great noise of horns coming and stopped to see a foreign hand go by a young gentleman was driving with a pretty girl beside him as we lined up at the curb he turned smiling from the girl and he caught our eyes he started and then bowing low he saluted us from the box it was muldoon end of part six end of 
the cave on thunder cloud by mary roberts reinhardt 